Good evening, and thank you for joining us. I'm Craig Davis, Director of Adult Services, and on behalf of everyone at the Chicago Public Library, welcome. Tonight's virtual program is another in our ongoing series of literary, cultural, and civic programming. And this particular programming is one of our Pride Month events during this month of June. During tonight's program, we'll be monitoring the online chat for questions from the audience for a brief Q&A following the conversation. So please feel free to ask questions in the chat. Tonight, it is my pleasure to welcome author Robert W. Fiesler here to discuss his book titled Tinderbox, The Untold Story of the Upstairs Lounge Fire and the Rise of Gay Liberation. Tinderbox has been called an essential work of American civil rights history. It was the winner of the Edgar Award in Best Fact Crime and Lambda Literary's Award for Emerging Writers. It mesmerizingly reconstructs the tragic 1973 fire that devastated New Orleans' subterranean gay community. Buried for decades, the upstairs lounge tragedy has only recently emerged as a catalyzing event of the gay liberation movement. We'll learn much more about it very shortly. To tell you a little more about our author, Robert Fiesler is the 2019 National Lesbian and Gay Journalist Association Journalist of the Year and a debut nonfiction author. Tinderbox was selected as a 2019 Stonewall Honor Book in nonfiction. Originally from our very own hometown of Chicago. He currently yes. lives with his husband and dog in New Orleans. He graduated co-valedictorian from the Columbia University Graduate School of Journalism and is a recipient of the Pulitzer Traveling Fellowship and the Linton Foundation uh, Fellowship in book writing. He writes about marginalized groups and overlooked people who make the world better for themselves and for all of us. As such, his heroes tend to be exiles and outcasts seeking their own strange forms of freedom. Now let's hear more. So please join me now in welcoming Robert W. Fiesler here to discuss Tinderbox. Wow. Thank you so much, Craig, for that beautiful introduction. Thank you to the Chicago Public Library for hosting this talk. Since I published Tinderbox in 2018, I have longed to give any sort of talk about the Chicagoland Upstairs Lounge victim, Guy Anderson. And I pursued the Tribune. I tried to get WBEZ to do the story. All of them questioned its relevance. So kudos, kudos to the Chicago Public Library for seeing the merit in this and for providing this forum so that we can tell the story of the Chicago Upstairs Lounge victim, Guy Anderson. And especially it's so important during this Pride Month. So thank you so much. All right. My name is Robert W. Fiesler, and I am the author of Tinderbox, the untold story of the upstairs lounge fire and the rise of gay liberation. Tinderbox is a work of nonfiction, a civil rights history about a notoriously unsolved arson fire that took place at a gay bar in 1973 New Orleans, and it claimed 32 lives. And this gay bar was located just a few steps away, actually from it's a few neighborhoods away from where I'm coming to you from New Orleans, actually on the ragtag border of the frame, famous French Quarter. So, so the French Quarter is the neighborhood that people come to during Mardi Gras for consequence free weekends and parties, et cetera. Tinderbox, my book, though, um, is a work of nonfiction. Just a second. Yeah. It's also a meditation on the consequences of closeted life in America. And by closeted, I mean homosexual Americans hiding from public view in a shared conspiracy to turn away, a conspiracy shared by heterosexuals and homosexuals in the 1970s, for set this, for, which sets the stage for what happens here. And this is a photograph of the upstairs lounge bar after the conflagration in 1973. But why dredge up all this difficult stuff at all? A, you know, Midwestern housewife at one of my parents' back backyard barbecues might argue with me about when, when we're talking about hard stuff in queer history. Some might ask, right? Okay, here's what I tell them. Because these acts of memory are acts of protest, right? Against those who would deny the truth of queer existence, queer American citizenship, queer blood, sweat, and pain. As the author Zora Neale Hurston once wrote, and I'll say it a couple times, if you are silent about your pain, they'll kill you and say you enjoyed it. Once again, if you are silent about your pain, they'll kill you and say you enjoyed it. Folks, 
That is exactly what happened in New Orleans, where I'm sitting almost five decades ago. And by nature of New Orleans being a gay mecca, that trauma and weirdness effectively spiderwebbed across the country, touching names and families and legacies, even here where you all sit in Chicago land. So this arson fire that I write about, and this is the site of the upstairs lounge bar currently in, in um, 2021. The upstairs lounge was located actually on the second story of this, of this corner building. So where the sun's just starting to hit the building, where, it's just, where the building just turns green from that maroon color. So this arson fire that I wrote about took place at a gay bar called the upstairs lounge. Which it claimed, and it claimed 32 lives and injured 15 others on the night of June 24th, 1973. No culprit was ever publicly named or charged for these murders. Yet, 43 years later, in 2016, when an armed American citizen named Omar Mateen gunned down 49 people and injured 53 others at a crowded gay nightclub in Orlando called Pulse, this bygone tragedy in New Orleans suddenly became resurrected in public memory. Old photos of the upstairs lounge victims went viral on Reddit and other social platforms, and urgent stories appeared in news outlets like the New York Times, the Daily Beast, etc., which altogether cited this fire in New Orleans, this is the entrance to, to the upstairs lounge, you'd have to enter it even in the 1970s from a side door, so it was a very secluded bar, right? All of which, the, all of these articles from 2016 and even past now cited this fire in New Orleans as a kind of antecedent to Orlando and other classic, and other classic examples of lone wolf violence, they say, striking the LGBTQIA, how many acronym letters do we have, plus community. Right, the Pulse nightclub shooting in 2016 would be publicly recognized by President Obama. Federal buildings, I remember, flew their flags at half staff and it was memorialized nationally. But the upstairs, the New Orleans tragedy, the New Orleans fire that I write about did not receive these dignities in its time. Why would one event be so acknowledged and the other so swept under the rug? This was the question, question that consumed me. The forgotten tragedy struck in June 1973, a typical summer Sunday at a popular New Orleans gay bar named the Upstairs Lounge, called so because of its, as you could probably imagine from here, its secluded second story location, only accessible, and this is a picture of the staircase now, but even then by a winding stairway that would twist up towards the second floor on an out of the way street called Iberville. Heading up this twisting stairwell in the 1970s, you have to imagine it was cloaked in cloth, would be a lot like entering a portal if you were a working class gay person, right? You were heading up, up and away from the world that oppressed you and into your favorite social club. And I love this photograph because that is the only extant image that exists of the upstairs lounge regulars, right? So that particular night at the upstairs lounge in June, uh, June 24th, 1973, attracted a larger than usual crowd of about 90 blue collar gay patrons who were all gathered for what was the biggest drink special of the week, the beer bust, okay? One dollar for two hours of unlimited draft beer, plus a returnable 50 cent deposit for the pitcher. OK, this was New Orleans in the 70s, man. These people were partying for real. All right. So you got to imagine men are laughing in this space and singing and bartenders are slinging drinks while a piano player who takes requests, OK, is pounding on the keys of a white baby grand piano. Right. These men had a particular song that they liked to croon loudly, drunkenly together to the point of tears, which became something of an anthem of the upstairs lounge. It was called United We Stand by the Brotherhood of Man. The lyrics went, I'm going to sing it once. I'm not a professional singer, but I want you to understand the nature of the 70s anthemic song and see if you can sort of vibe off the energy it's giving. OK, the lyrics went, <clears throat> mum, 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 mum. United we stand, divided we fall. And if our back should ever be against the wall, we'll be together, together you and I. And then they would toast each other, right? Toasting each other, lifting their glasses to each other and expressing solidarity at a moment in time when the simple act of being who they were posed 
existential dangers. So you have to imagine in this space, couples are congregating together, some of whom had been joined together in holy unions, they were called, quote unquote, early same-sex marriages, spiritual conjugations, unrecognized by legal entities of the era on course, but authorized by a then radical gay affirming Christian ministry called the Metropolitan Community Church, which had a branch in New Orleans that often conducted religious services and yes, holy union receptions at the upstairs lounge. Men in this bar, all right, and this is a fun picture of the bartender Buddy Rasmussen on a Halloween um, in 1972 or 1971, I believe, at the upstairs lounge. And I show this because this is the typical working class gay bar decor you're gonna see, okay? This wasn't like a Land's End sort of place. They didn't chipotle out the look of the bars yet to make them sleek. You're gonna see, if you walked into a gay bar in the 1970s, you would see shoddy wallpaper, you see the red flock wallpaper, and you would see pinup posters right and it would be of dudes and they were lifted out of women's magazines usually okay so a poster up in the back there at, uh, uh, is a famous image that's Burt Reynolds lying naked on a, be a bearskin rug okay a bear on a bearskin rug all right, all right. and that, that was considered so tongue-in-cheek and enticing at the period of time and then right behind the wig of uh, the bartender, there's a there, you can see like a, a poster of a gentleman that's kind of going like this in the background. That's the Olympic swimmer Mark Spitz. He was like a multi medalist and he was cute. He had like a mustache and he's like smiling with his gold medals dangling over his star spangled speedo. Okay, so that's the decor. That's the energy and atmosphere. So men in this bar are snuggling and holding hands, right? Occasionally sinking a kiss together, though the bar dead have rules against more flagrant forms of affection. Okay, this was in a bathhouse with men parading around in towels, schlongs bouncing. All right, although sex and sexual expression were not frowned upon per se, and there was indeed a bathhouse down the street, it's called Club New Orleans Baths on Toulouse, if needed, or, and I'm sorry if I'm going to make people blush, this is 70 sexuality, there was a glory hole in the upstairs lounge bathroom, right? To, if needed to facilitate a bit of previewing of the merchandise among gay men, okay? Before the era of Grindr or Tinder obviated that need for, through private folders. This is what people did, all right? All of this fun though, happened fully but carefully inside this oasis, the outside world being dominated by heterosexual prejudice and even inside this bar, this safe space, being tempered by the fear of snitching, right? Of gay men in trouble, ratting out other gay men to police, or if romantically rejected and salty, jealously what was then called dropping a nickel in a payphone. Payphones cost a nickel then. Uh, oftentimes when I give this talk, I have to pause the talk and, tell, and talk about like to Gen Zers what a payphone was. But anyway, I'm not gonna do this now, but payphones cost a nickel back then. And people would sometimes drop a nickel if they were salty and queer to do what? To, uh, to be a quizzling, to alert employers or law enforcement or families of a gay man's location and activities, outing them, right? That did happen. Sadly, to paraphrase Shakespeare, these violent delights at the upstairs lounge had violent ends. So you have to picture the front staircase door to the upstairs lounge opening and you turn expecting to greet a friend and flames suddenly shoot into the room as if launched from a flamethrower, cleaving 44 feet in a back trap that swallows up the crowd of men singing at the white baby grand piano and chewing up wallpaper and decorations and burning hair, clothes, skin, and trapping and quite literally eating away half of those in front of you. So this is the insurance map of the, an overlay of the upstairs lounge. Um, and so the lower right hand corner would be the stair where it says two main entrance around. That's the, the main staircase entrance that you guys saw the photo of that'll take you up to the second store of the up second story of the upstairs lounge where there was a fire door. And then it, where it says fire spread, that's where the, the fire enters the first room as if shot from a cannon. It happens that fast, that fast. So you have to imagine, visualize it, having 30 seconds to choose which way to run. As people scream around you, bodies stampede, perhaps being separated from a committed lover or a longtime friend who doesn't yet realize that this is an emergency and thus is not going to be make it out, making it outside with you. Try to fathom 29 friends, dead, gone, extinguished, rendered into gruesome carbon mounds in a pile of bodies that some emergency workers would describe as, quote, the worst thing they've ever seen in a fire that burned for less than 20 minutes. 
with three more doomed to agonizing deaths in a hospital burn wound. Imagine living what came to be called the deadliest fire on record in New Orleans history, the worst mass killing of homosexuals in US history during the 20th century, a record that would stand for 43 years, a record that was never meant to be broken. And then you would see then the reaction that, that of this city, that it was worth more, a little more to the city of New Orleans and even nationally than a few days of headlines. This is the paper of record, the New Orleans Times-Picayune, the Monday after the fire. Um, front page news of the upstairs lounge, right? So it was worth just a few days of headlines, though, and then a proverbial paragraph on page eight of the newspaper. This is the Wednesday following the upstairs lounge tragedy. The deadliest fire in New Orleans history does what? Drops off the front page of the local paper. Isn't big news anymore. Why? The character of the individuals who died and the nature of the bar that had burned became widely known. The Democratic mayor of New Orleans, man named Moon Landrieu, who's actually the, you know, the patriarch of a very powerful political family down here, in many ways also a forerunner in the arena of racial civil rights, remained out of town in Europe for two weeks rather than a cause a hoopla by returning to face a fallout of the upstairs lounge fire. And when Mayor Moon Landrieu eventually did return, Weeks later to New Orleans, too late to be a practical help to the wives or the children of victims or the survivors, he absolved the city of its behavior in a press conference by saying, in direct relation to the homosexual angle to the fire, he said, quote, I was not aware of any lack of concern in the community. That's what he said. News reports, the police inquiry to name a culprit for this intentionally set fire dropped off. Most believe that these were actually just 32 negligible, negligible deaths, like a prison fire or the burning of a crack den or something like that. The modern equivalent, right, of, of all that in the era of queer criminalization in the 1970s, when all of it was considered part of the same seedy underworld. And most people in New Orleans didn't even bother to learn the name Roger Dale Nunez, the chief suspect, who was never questioned by the local police police, though he was located by them, caught and released in suspicious cir circumstances nearly a week later in an apartment a mere two doors down from the ruins of the upstairs lounge. If they'd just gone knocking, they would have found him. Roger Dale Nunez had actually been in violation for probation for previous crimes the night he drunkenly entered the upstairs lounge bar, only to be violently ejected from that establishment, screaming, quote, I'm going to burn you all out. That's what he screamed. It was heard by multiple people. Quote, I'm going to burn you all out. That's what criminologists call motive. OK, and he screamed this out 30 minutes before the fire began. Multiple people remember this. But what happened, Roger Dale Nunez was permitted to roam free in New Orleans, where he committed more crimes and built more and conned more people out of money, though he had outstanding warrants for his arrest until he died by suicide the following year. The Catholic Church in a city so Catholic, the Archbishop was called the, the Pope of New Orleans, okay, refused St. Louis Cathedral, the city's holy basilica, for a permit for, to host a public memorial to mourn the upstairs lounge dead. Then the Archbishop does this weird thing, seemingly moved by compassion weeks later. He does speak up. In, a, in an out of the way column of a barely read Catholic newspaper, and the column itself is in the tiniest of prints, where he re this archbishop reveals surprisingly the correct number of the upstairs lounge victims and the fact that the fire seemed intentional. Okay, this is his, in, you know, in the spirit of deep Christian concern and passion, we offer prayers for the repose, et cetera. This is what he said in the 70s. This was not a man oblivious, but informed to everything that was going on surrounding the upstairs lounge. A person who followed the news closely and therefore shares a portion of the responsibility and the apathy that ensued. Three of the bodies at the upstairs lounge were burned so badly that they could never be identified and they were buried without markers in a remote powders field in New Orleans East where they lie to this day. I'm about a mile from that location actually. There still is no actually gravestones for them either. Strikingly though, one identified victim of the upstairs lounge fire and a patron and World War II veteran who was the pastor of the local gay MCC church known as Reverend Bill Larson suffered indignity in life and even worse, indignity and death. 
So what happened? He'd been born William Roscoe Larson in Estill County, Kentucky, where his family had owned a farm only to lose it when his father, the breadwinner, died from drinking poison whiskey. You can't even make this stuff up. Drank poison whiskey and died and left the family without their breadwinner. His single mother then moved the family back to her hometown of Hamilton, Ohio, which is a Cincinnati suburb, where he landed in state care from about age one to age 15. After the war, he married, divorced, and then ran from his hometown to where? Chicago, okay? Where he took on a new name and a new life. This is something that you couldn't even believe. I didn't even put this in my book, right? He took on a new name and a new life as was possible in those days. You could move to a new, a new city and take on an alias. And he became Roz Larson, right? The Chicago night and radio club entertainer often a singer at gentlemen's bars, actually, before turning up in New Orleans and getting involved in the local gay-friendly church. Okay, Larson had, Bill, William Larson and Roz Larson had since changed his name, right, to Bill Larson, right, the pastor of the local church. Why? To place a buffer between himself and the risks of his lifestyle um, and prevent news from, from, of an arrest from perhaps even blowing back from his, to his conservative family in Hamilton, Ohio, so that they did not attempt to locate him in New Orleans. Why? Because did, he didn't want them to perhaps lock up the black sheep of the family as he was in the place where gay men often disappeared forever in the 1970s, mental institutions, okay? As recently though as 1972, Bill Larson had tried to mend family relations by visiting his brother and sister-in-law in Jackson, Florida, only to have them throw him out of the house when he spoke of what? Of being a gay minister. Reverend Bill Larson, burned to death, trapped in the window bars of the upstairs lounge. You can Google the photograph. It's the famous image. I'm not gonna show it to you all. It's, it's incredibly grisly when you see what happened to him. With his last breath, he screamed the words, oh God, no. And then his body was left there, exposed in its gruesome final repose for at least four hours. He became a spectacle for the media and drunken onlookers taking pictures, which circulated internationally. To the coroner, he became a number, victim number 15, right? Afterwards, when that number became a name again, Bill Larson's own mother back in Hamilton, Ohio, for shame, refused to accept his ashes, his remains. That was the stigma associated with this lifestyle and with the fire in that era. Just as strikingly, the 24th upstairs lounge victim with a stronger Chicago connection, a guy named Guy Owen Anderson, presumed, was presumed at first to be an out-of-town salesman, and he was identified, not through his remains, which were scorched too badly, actually, but through a half-melted hotel room key. That led, key led authorities back to a room at the CD Country Club Motel off Airline Highway in a New Orleans suburb called Metairie, where he checked in under a slightly misspelled version of his last name, Anderson with an O actually. So they found, right? And this is the newspaper report of Anderson being identified, but with a slightly misspelled version of his last name. They found in Anderson's hotel room, a state of Illinois state employment service card, which linked this 41 year old man back to a Chicagoland address and this mysterious job at Wilmark System Services and a family back in Palatine, Illinois. And we're going to get into all of his past and origins because I really I think he loved the most interesting life and I want people to know about Guy Owen Anderson. So um, blonde haired, blue eyed, and this was his obituary in the Daily Herald when, when back home people recognized that he passed away. Guy Anderson was born in Chicago on November 17th, 1931, and his fab family sub uh, quickly and subsequently moved out of the suburbs into a beautiful bungalow where 225 North Plum Grove in Palatine, Illinois. A younger sister, Avis, followed his birth five years later. Their father worked in retail hardware sales and their mother was an elementary school teacher. According to his sister, Avis Berg, formerly Avis Anderson, maiden name, um, who I had the honor of interviewing, but who feels so much pain and trauma and having to recall the death of her brother in this way that actually I, I conducted the interview with her through email. Um, I've never actually spoken to her, but she wrote the most beautiful 
uh, treatise about her brother and their recollections, and it's never been aired before. And I'm going to read some of this verbatim as a way to honor Avis, who still mourns her brother, Guy Anderson. So according to Avis, um, quote, we were raised in a warm and loving but not demonstrative family. We had a very stable home life. We lived in the same house and went to school with the same kids from grades K through 12. Avis continued, Guy was five years older than I. He was very extroverted and had lots of friends. We were not particularly close as children due to the age difference and perhaps personality. However, we were not antagonistic with each other. Guy liked to ride, ride bikes and ice skate, but he did not participate in team sports. So this is a photograph of brother and sister circa 1940, the blurry one. And then to the right is Guy Anderson's senior class photo from 1950. Where? Because Guy attended Palatine High School. So he attended Palatine High School in the 1940s right, late 1940s, and he thrived, as his sister recalled, quote, as a teenager and high schooler, Guy loved acting, and he played in many school productions. He received rave reviews. He liked music, especially the clarinet. He liked to be dramatic, and I remember the day when he came down the stairs smoking a cigarette. My parents were not happy, so he was a popular, if eccentric kid who was elected to the city council, and he was also elected president of the local drama club, and this is a photograph of him at the dramatic club of Palatine High School. But by his senior year, right, at Palatine High School, Anderson was fully bit by the acting bug. He was president of the school drama club, the lead in four plays and musicals, including, I'm going to name some of them, Beauty and the Beef, John Loves Mary, the irony there. And his senior yearbook notes, his quote is what, there's no business like show business. This guy was wanting to be an actor so bad. This was actually the high school auditorium, right? Uh, where he trod the boards, the stage where he embodied characters and lives other than his own for the first time. And he heard raucous applause and laughter. And in this place that you're looking at, he experienced what were undoubtedly some of the happiest memories of his life. Incidentally, right, this building, which is the auditorium of Palatine High School, the old one, um, still exists. Although the original Palatine High School was demolished in the 1970s, the auditorium was preserved by the local community as the Cutting Hall Performing Arts Center, which stands to this day. Here was where Guy Anderson once stood as a very much a performer to be with stars in his eyes. So Anderson graduated right from Palatine High School in 1950. He apprenticed for the summer uh, season at the Chevy Chase Theater Company, which some people still remember, I'm, I'm sure. And he enrolled as a, in that fall as a freshman at the Goodman Theater School of Dramatics downtown, where evidently, right, evidently after he enrolled, Guy Anderson began to wrestle with himself, okay? Struggling where to find his next step. He'd struggled actually in that way for the next decade, dropping out of various sisters, various places. According to his sister Avis, quote, Guy studied Islam for a while and read the Quran. He studied French culture and developed a French accent. I love it when people develop fake, fake French accents. That was so common for gay dudes back then. He liked being different. None of these pursuits lasted very long though. Guy had a difficult time finishing college. He would drop out close to graduation. In the summers between class classes, he did summer stock acting. At one time, he actually bought an engagement ring with a large emerald, not a diamond. The girl did not accept. I still have the ring, his sister says. I did not know the girl. So in 1959, Anderson eventually graduated from Eastern Illinois State Teachers College, and he taught English and drama at the high school level for a bit, always, in, always encouraging his theater students, taking them auditions for colleges, state festivals, et cetera, until, until that ceaseless crush of teaching, right? Lesson plans, paper grading, et cetera, grew tiresome for this actor with aspirations of his own, right? Through it all though, I wanna emphasize, through it all, Anderson remained a beloved part of his family, right? This is him in the family portrait at his sister Avis's 1962 wedding. He's farthest to the left here, okay? Then, right? It was then considered this wedding, which was a beautiful affair. There are his parents too, if you can see. This was considered a crowning achievement for middle-class parents, seeing their daughter married off well. And he is part of that happy pose there. Avis then moved to Arizona with her new husband after this wedding. According to Avis, that was when her brother finally made a play for his big dreams too. Quote, 
He went to California to make it big in Hollywood. He was a little plump when he left and quite svelte when he returned. I asked him how he lost the weight and he said, I did not have much money, so I could not buy much food. If you do not eat, you lose weight. He did not make it big in Hollywood and returned to our parents' home. So he came back kind of dejected from that thing, denied his life's dream. By the late 1960s, Guy Anderson settled into a new career with a national company, though, called Wilmark Services Systems as what? As a corporate private investigator. Imagine a secret shopper, right? But like on steroids, a man who roll, would roll into town looking like a traveling salesman, but empowered by a hiring company to look into that company's employees with such expeditiousness, actually, it wouldn't even be legal now, that city police required roving Wilmark detectives to be fingerprinted and registered at private, as private investigators when they came to town, as Guy Anderson was in New Orleans. According to his sister Avis, quote, I took this job to be like a secret shop, shopper, that's what she thought it was, to report to companies on their employees by pretending to be a customer. When I heard about this job, I thought it was perfect for a frustrated actor like my brother. I thought this job that it was this job that brought him to New Orleans. He he was there on business and not really living there. And he used my parents' house as a home base in between jobs. Hence why New Orleans police found a state of Illinois state employment service card at Guy Anderson's hotel. Okay. And why Anderson in New Orleans and why Anderson had intentionally misspelled his last name when registering for a room. Anderson was a corporate private detective in town on a job doing his snooping work. And what was the work? All right, Wilmark Service Systems, on the, the photograph on the right, that's the building that was in. Um, Wilmark Service Systems corporate office in New Orleans was located in the Carondelet building, an art deco tower in the central business district. On a street that actually, Carondelet follows the curve of the Mississippi River, but this, this street changes its name when it hits the French Quarter into a name that you might have all heard of. Bourbon Street, okay? Indeed, one of Wilmark's biggest, biggest clients in New Orleans was located just one block off of Bourbon Street at 727 Iberville, and that was what? The Playboy Club, okay. There, Wilmark investigators would test the waitresses called bunnies after the branded Playboy term, Playboy bunnies, um, for their honesty and their service. And can you possibly think of better cover for a closeted gay visitor in 1970s New Orleans, right? I'm a private investigator in town to research the Playboy Club officer. I couldn't be homosexual. All right. The journey, though, from the Playboy Club. Here, I don't want to look. I'm not going to make you guys look at that picture for very long. That was an image of the upstairs lunch disaster. So we'll go there, but I'm not going to make you sit on it. Um, the journey from the Playboy Club at 727 Iberville to the upstairs lounge gay bar at 604 Iberville was just about a block away, which is likely how Guy Anderson ended up at the, the upstairs lounge on the night of June 24th, 1973, the night of the fire. And that and an interesting story I'd heard about Anderson actually knowing the gay minister who died in the window, Reverend Bill Larson, from Larson's Ross Larison Chicago nightclub days. Some recall Anderson attending Larson's local church service in New Orleans that Sunday and coming to the bar that evening for more conversation with his old acquaintance. The costs, though, the costs of such a meeting uh, at a pleasant, discreet community gay bar Anderson never could have guessed. He perished that night of extensive third and fourth degree burns over 90% of his body surface. His sister recalls that night, quote, I was a young wife and mother with two young sons living in Flagstaff, Arizona. They were three and five. I did not have much contact with my brother during these years just because of distance. I was fixing dinner and heard of TV and heard on the TV about a fire in New Orleans bar that claimed lives. It flashed through my mind. Guy is in New Orleans. It would be just like him to go to a gay bar. Later, my parents called me to confirm my worst nightmare that Guy had died in the fire. There were several small articles in the Arizona newspapers nothing big. Anderson would be identified. This is, this is the scene of the tragedy itself. So you can see what it was like when they were bringing the bodies outside from the bar after the fire and laying them down side by side on the street. They brought them down one by one. 
He'd by, be identified by June 30th and his remains would be shipped home to Palatine, Illinois for a visitation service the following Thursday at all and son's funeral home and a funeral promptly afterwards, not on any church property, okay, but at the funeral parlor burial in Arlington Heights. The family requested in lieu of flowers donations made to their local church that they all went to, First United Church of Christ in Palestine. As Avis remembers, quote, guy never came out to me as being gay. And if he did to my parents, they never discussed it with me. His death was so sudden and so far away, it was a terrible shock. My husband's sons and I went to Chicago for the funeral and to support my parents, but we never discussed the circumstances of his death. His funeral was in a funeral home and attended by friends of my parents. There was one much younger man who came late and left early that I did not know. I was only home for a few days and did not discuss his death circumstances with neighbors or relatives. And this is his gravestone. Afterwards, afterwards, families of other upstairs lounge victims became irate when they learned that the upstairs lounge bar was in fact a fire trap, hadn't been up to code, not inspected in fact for at least two years prior to the tragedy. But many of these families and survivors actually joined together to file a costly and time consuming lawsuit against city and state to seek financial restitution. The Andersons though, did not follow this news and choose not, chose not to join the suit, okay? And civil justice regardless was ultimately denied to all the families anyway by a three judge panel at the district level who ruled two to one that the plaintiffs could not sue city or state agencies for damages due to quote, failure to inspect or negligent inspection in its ruling. And you can't even make this stuff up. The court cited an earlier case involving a negligent dog catcher and a roving dog with rabies as precedent. The civil court system would not redeem the grievances of the families and survivors of the upstairs lounge in the absence of criminal justice. Freed from financial liabilities then, the city and state carried on. Families that participated in this lawsuit each ended up receiving an insulting settlement from the bar owners of a few hundred dollars each. And they got it in the late 1970s. The upstairs lounge tragedy, similarly in that oeuvre and that sort of milieu, was so swept under the rug that for decades it lingered unsolved, unspeakable, unacceptable. Don't bring it up. Nobody wanted to talk about the deadliest event to strike New Orleans in 1973, six days, six weeks, six months later, not to mention six years. And this seemed fitting to the average citizen working hard to make this event and its legacy disappear for years. Though the legacy did not disappear. This is the bronze plaque laid in 2003 in front of the historic upstairs lounge entrance after local allies spent eight years to controversially and in a very lonely journey, raise some $5,000 to plank up, place a marker in the sidewalk before the historic entrance to the upstairs lounge bar on the 30th anniversary of the tragedy. Anderson's name, still misspelled, is included on this monument to the event. Looking at this plaque, I'm reminded always of the resilience and diversity of the LGBT plus alliance and another powerful journey that comes from looking life in the face, I think, which is the power of truth and reconciliation. Oftentimes, especially through the upstairs lounge legacy, I've noticed by recognizing the fragility of life, we can sometimes start treating it with, more, it with more respect and human nature sometimes rises to the occasion, even just when you might rule it out. This is a picture of something I never thought would happen. After my book, Tinderbox, published in 2018 at the 45th anniversary memorial observances for the upstairs lounge victims and families in a French Quarter church, I watched New Orleans Mayor Latoya Cantrell, the first female mayor in Crescent City history, march down the center church aisle and spin around in a white pantsuit and recognize that she did what no one had ever done before. She recognized the upstairs lounge and its legacy as part of city history. I wanted to thank her. I was so overwhelmed. And I went up to her and I introduced her uh, to Marilyn LeBlanc, who's the sweet old lady that you see um, in the photograph there, the sister of an upstairs lounge victim named Ferris LeBlanc. Mayor Cantrell kissed Marilyn on both cheeks. And from that day on, they began working together. Something else I never thought I'd see. 
This is the New York Times obituary for MCC of New Orleans pastor, Reverend Bill Larson, published in 2019, who in this man infamously burned to death in the upstairs lounge bar window. This obituary published 46 years after his gruesome death, a man whose mother refused to accept his ashes, a man that shame erased has finally properly been remembered, eulogized in our nation's paper of record, right? where important icons like Rosa Parks, Muhammad Ali are also Im immortalized in print. In that same obituary, living members of Bill Larson's family stepped forward in a historic act of restitution with an apology that symbolically redrew the man they now call their great uncle Roscoe, because they called him Roscoe when he was younger, back onto their family tree. Lastly, for Guy Anderson, distant relatives learning of his historic death at the upstairs lounge and of his love for the theater, all of those wonderful moments on the stage of the old, old auditorium at Palatine High School, pooled together money and made a donation to the Cutting Hall Performing Arts Center in Palatine on the back of a seat in, the, in that auditorium. You could walk right past it. The place where Guy Anderson was happiest is now emblazoned a gold marker bearing Guy Anderson's name. He is remembered there. As his sister sums it up, I have always felt Guy lost his life before he found his place in the world. He did not leave a home in a physical sense or a family other than his birth family. Selfishly, I was often angry, not that Guy was gay or not, but that he put himself in a position to lose his life. He left me to handle our parents and their old age issues by himself. I wish we could have matured together, had more time together as adults where a five-year age difference is nothing. He did not get to experience being an uncle other than one or two, two brief times he enjoyed immensely. I did not get to say goodbye to tell him that I loved him. That is the story. Between the upstairs lounge fire in 1973 and the Pulse nightclub shooting in 2016, a powerful social institution in America called The Closet, that widespread conspiracy to turn away from all things queer, failed. It failed miserably. And as a result, millions of queer citizens ventured from the shadows where the upstairs lounge victims had dwelled and where into the open. But I want to emphasize again in this present day context that an act of memory for the upstairs lounge is still an act of protest, act of protest against those age old forces that continue to deny the basic truth of queer American citizenship that wish to conveniently erase all memory of the institutional closet in our nation's past, which wasn't an institutional of, of family values or safety at all. What was it? It was an institution, I hope you could see, of great corruption and great violence. So let's return to, this is a photograph of the upstairs lounge bartender, Buddy Rasmussen and his lover, Adam Fonten on the left, who perished in the fire. Let's return to what Zora Neale Hurston wrote, quote, if you are silent about your pain, they'll kill you and say you enjoyed it. By telling and retelling this story, we are emphasizing this truth. These citizens lived, they died violently, and they suffered in their subjugation. As a subculture historian, which is really what I am, I, I find there's nothing more exciting, nothing more fulfilling, nothing more essential actually than fighting for your rights in America with a little bit of the truth, the track record of our nation on your side. And the truth of the upstairs lounge story is this, it shouldn't be controversial. Queer folk were and are part of the fabric of this country and of humanity, always have been, right? Since the first written records of civilization, they, we manifest anew with every generation. In other words, what? We're here, we're queer, get used to it, okay? Get proud, be proud, this pride especially. And in that spirit, I want us to remember those lyrics of fellowship that the upstairs lounge patrons like Bill Larson and Guy Anderson were singing like their lives depended on it that night because those voices believed in something. Let's remember what they were singing with their friends. In a fateful bar seconds before a fire claimed them all, they sang, they were singing, united we stand, divided we fall. 
Thank you. Thank you, Robert, for that heartfelt telling of this very tragic and disturbing period of American and uh, LBGT history. It was, uh, that's really something. Uh, I do have a few questions here for you. Sure. Um, obviously, this was, this is a very difficult subject. The story is horrifying. Mm -hmm. How were you able to maintain your emotional well-being during the writing process? Oh, gosh. Um, okay. Well, most reporters who write about trauma will like muscle through this question, but like, I'll talk about what I really did. So um, writing about tragedies like this, and especially when you're writing about others who um, are part of what you could call your same community, um, you tend to relate to them quite a bit. And as a journalist, you sort of have to blunt that. Um, and it's very hard to do. You're creating dissonance within yourself. So you view them fairly alongside all of the other individuals you're portraying who might not be part of your group. You can't have a horse in the race, right? The evidence is what's supposed to dictate the narrative of the story. Um, and to do that was very hard. It was taxing on me. Um, it started to take a physical toll at a various point, writing the fire scene itself, which I never read in public. I don't think I could actually physically do it. When I, it took me three months to write those 10 pages, I cried and threw up through writing it. Um, and eventually I sought um, the services of a grief counselor to help deal with an, what's called ancillary trauma, um, which is uh, not, it wasn't a pain that was mine, right? I never knew these people. My imagination had placed myself into every corner of that burning bar so much that I was experiencing uh, the trauma of the event as if I had been there, but it was, uh, it was an assumed weight. So um, I, I had to talk it out for quite a span of time to learn how to set down um, to learn to, how to set down the pain, that pain, a pain that was not my own. Um, and I think that's an important thing that journalists and historians who co cover trauma talk about publicly. Um, and um, as a result of doing that, I was sort of able to reframe the event from the context of the upstairs lounge legacy. Though this event is tragic, horrible, terrible, um, irrecoverable. Like we can't go, I can't go in a time machine and undo what happens to these people in this bar. Um, the legacy of the upstairs lounge fire is in its own right, um, an interesting and almost miraculous thing that, that was really born in the, the, this century, not in the 20th century. And that it is remarkable that the upstairs lounge is known and that we are talking about it right now, considering how much people wanted to erase it. Thank you. Well, um, another question, as a writer of nonfiction, there are a lot of other important stories from LGBT history that you could have chosen to write. So mm -hmm. what moved you to write about this particular incident? So I'm a subculture reporter and underground storyteller, meaning I like to like, I peek beneath the surface of things or I like to pry up the rock and see all the little bugs cry around. And I'm really into reporting um, hidden human communities that are marginalized or subjugated within a culture. I'm a queer, I'm a gay guy, I'm a queer person myself, but I've, I, I longed um, in throughout journalism school and afterwards to tell a story about an era of American history where queer folk, gay folk, existed in a subculture, existed in an, in an underground. And I wanted to place it in the context to try to remind people of the shocking reality of what it was like and the disparity between that reality and this one. So when I heard about the upstairs lounge fire, um, and I learned that this was a working class, um, blue collar gay community. And in many reasons, the fact that they were working class, these people weren't moneyed or politically connected. That had a, large, had a lot to do with the fact of why this event was deemed negligible. I, of course, became obsessed. I mean, I, I just, I had to report it. And the fact that it all incurs in the setting of the gay underworld of the 1970s French Quarter, I, there was no ignoring it. Wow. Um, I understand in, in reading a little of the background that you actually moved to New Orleans to write this book. Um, yeah, uh, I spent, yeah, I spent about half of five years and then my husband and I live here now. So you plan to stay? Oh, honey. I don't know, honey. Like I, <laughs> we love it now. I've lived here now since 2018. I'm from, I'm originally from Chicago. I have a Midwest accent. My family still lives in Naperville and I I still tell people my home is Chicago. 
And now I'm a gunkle of five nieces under the age of five. Okay, pray for me. But seriously, it's very fun as well. I can just, when they scream, I just hand off the little kids to my siblings or whatever. I only deal with the positive part. But so like, I love, like Chicago is the city of my heart. Like I listen to that song, Lakeshore Drive and I ball. Like I still miss it so much. So I can't imagine that my future is not gonna place me back in the city that is my home and the greatest city in the world. I mean, and I shouldn't even say this, I live in New Orleans, I'm probably pissing off people from New Orleans now. New Orleans is a remarkable foreign country in US soil. I love it so much here. There's so, so many aspects of it are quirky and idiosyncratic and unique, but I know at some point I'm gonna end up back in Chicago. And hopefully um, at that point, I'll wanna tell some of the stories of the queer underworld in Chicago um, that was birthed out of the fact that in 62, Illinois became the first state to decriminalize um, male, male relations, sodomy. Um, and that from that birthed an incredible queer community that I think people, it still remains under un, uh, uncovered. The fact that probably from, through the 60s to the 80s, so Chicago was like one of the most important queer meccas and there need to be more books about it. I would agree. And uh, I'm sure our, I and my Chicago colleagues who are listening don't mind you saying that we are the greatest city in the world. So. Okay. <laughs> We're happy to hear that, okay? Yeah. How, how was the book received in New Orleans itself? Really well, very interesting, very well. I thought that I would be reject, it would be like organ rejection and they would sense my outsiderness and that um, I, would, uh, I would sort of be called an armchair historian or doing a drive-by history and that they would repel the work and find all, uh, you know, find all of the little uh, nitpick it and all sorts of stuff. And instead, um, it's been widely embraced. Um, I'm friends with most like uh, queer geographers and uh, historians, queer or not, in New Orleans now. Um, the, uh, the queer community has been open arms in terms of it. And then a lot of the people who appear as figures in the book too, it's always weird when you write about someone, even if you've interviewed them 20 times for like 20 hours, you never, human beings are incomprehensible. You never know how they'll react actually to seeing their, themselves represented in writing. And I was fortunate. They liked their portrayals. Like, so I, I um, survivors of the upstairs lounge fire, I'm still very close with. Some of them, a few of them live in New Orleans. Most of them were actually um, scattered throughout the country in the diaspora that followed Katrina. Um, but I'm still in touch with all of them. So I would say it's been a very generous um, response to the book. Um, what is the building used for now? And yeah. are there annual um, like vigils or ceremonies to mark this event? That yeah, it's a good question. So after, okay, so in the 70s, when the bar burned, the upstairs lounge was the second floor, it was upstairs. The, the first floor bar on that building was called the Gemini, and that still exists. It's a, it's a 24 hour bar still owned by the same family, the Masachi family. And it's a fun place. You could get food there. You can get late night gumbo there. I'm not gonna say it's the best food. I'm not gonna tell you that. But it's like it's a, it's like a sawdusty type bar that you can still go into, and it's it's pretty much, um, it's pretty much the same bar, the Gemini. The upstairs lounge though burned, and then what happened was the city ignored it so much that they just left visible signs of charring on the building for years into the 1980s and just threw up plywood boards. Then at a certain point, the management of the Gemini decided they were gonna rent out and rehabilitate that second story and they turned it into storage space and office space. It's never been reoccupied as another bar, in large part because the first bar, the fire proves, wasn't safe. There was only one main entrance or exit for the public the whole time. That's why, that's why so many people got trapped there. The emergency exit in the back, in the back area um, was unmarked and that caused so much of the confusion that caused even more death um, on that fateful day. Um, but so, and that, that was the first question. And then about what's, so the bar currently, it's not utilized at all, except for storage from uh, as, as a first, you can go up there. Like the owners of the gym and I, if you're an interested journalist or party and you caught them in the morning when they're doing their, um, doing their um and, and doing their rounds and their errands bringing stuff down they'll let you upstairs and you could still see the charring in the wall of the bricks and especially on the staircase you can see signs of fire and burning um and it's quite eerie um and disturbing to go up there to be honest i don't i've, I've been up there four or five times i don't like going up there um and so now um so most of the time you, you'll see now if you take a few steps away from the staircase door though that's where the plaque is laid in the sidewalk 
Um, and uh, that's been there since the 30th anniversary of the fire. And every year, there's various organizations that will do upstairs lounge memorials. So recently, New Orleans is a special city and it's very queer and gay focused. So I hope I'm not shocking people. There's a leather group called the Crescent City Leathermen. They, um, and they're, they're leather daddies. They, and they sponsor, and leather pups and stuff. They sponsor the events. Um, and put it on and they, they do a very nice ceremony. Usually there's a minister from the local MCC church, which still exists. It actually survived the fire in all these years. It just recently celebrated its 50th anniversary as a church. Whoever is the minister of that church will usually come say a few words, then there'll be a historian recite something, etc. Usually there's one or two of these different things. And then various churches will do religious memorials as well. So the, there'll be some combination of secular and religious just to make sure that the event is remembered. Great. Well, um, I know you talked a little bit about the possibility of exploring Chicago's historic gay past, but um, may, we'll try to end this on a little happier note right now. Yeah. So can you expand on that a bit or tell us what what projects may be definite right now or yeah. more about what, what is up what we can expect from you in your future yeah. next time we host you. I'm writing my second book about Anita Bryant and what came before her in terms of anti-queer movements in Florida. Anita Bryant, for those who don't know, for the children, was an anti-homosexual spokesperson in the late 1970s who had been the runner-up right, to uh, for Miss America one year. And um, she had this big sort of bouffant hairdo and she was like a lipstick pageant woman. And she was also the spokesperson for Florida Orange Juice. And she, um, and, and she also sang schmaltzy hits like on records and they're unlistenable. I've tried listen, I bought Anita Bryant records to try there. It's not like listening to Andy Williams. There's no charm to it. She is unlistenable. I'm just telling you, she's a bad singer. But anyway, she would sing these schmaltzy hits and she became a very large anti-homosexual spokesperson. And she came out of Dade County, Florida. She was like the first in this, in sort of the era of, of identity politics, like a, a, a pre Sarah Palin type that said all sorts of stuff about how queer folk were a danger to children because we wanted to recruit them and we molested them and that made them gay and all sorts of things like that. So I'm, um, Anita Bryant was then, um, she caused a, a hoopla in Miami-Dade County where they had, they had previously passed an ordinance of protecting um, employment and certain things. Uh, it was an anti-discrimination ordinance protecting for sexual orientation. And she was able to, to successfully rally conservatives and get that ordinance rescinded. And then she danced a jig, it was so annoying. And then she went across the country thinking she was gonna tour in a victorious, vic in like a victory lap from concert to concert. And where did she go? She went to Chicago and she sang at the, I think it was the Medina Temple. And the 3,000 protesters showed up and were so loud that they could, the people inside the concert hall couldn't hear her singing. And she went from town to town like that. Um, and so I'm doing an, an, essentially a, a story about that and what came before in terms of anti-queer movements in the interesting state of Florida that birthed a lot of what we know now as social conservatism. And I love explaining social conservatives uh, to themselves. They don't know where they got half of their ideas, half of their prejudice they got because someone told them something when they were four or five years old and they believed it their whole lives. So it's interesting for them to note, to, to note and see the origins of some of that nonsense. Um, and that's gonna be my second book. Wow, well, that's very exciting. It, is Anita Bryant still living? She is. Oh my God, she is. Well, do you she think maybe we could get her to appear with you here at the Chicago I Public Library? That. I would love to meet with Anita. This would be great. It could be a wonderful okay. interview talk. I would behave myself. To be well, honest, she doesn't do interviews. I would, would have I, to. <laughs> yeah, you would have I would. To. I would absolutely behave myself if, if Anita Bryant wanted to do an interview with me for Chicago Public Library absolute are you oh, joking we will talk okay <laughs> well uh robert uh that's about all the time we have for tonight thank you for joining us this has been a very difficult thank story. you so you made it a, you made it easier in your really lovely presentation and very respectful of this very tragic story from gay history so we're very appreciative of having you here for one of our keynote Pride Month programs. Very, very happy to have had you. Thank you, this was um, an honor. Thank you. So to our listeners, thanks to all of you for joining us. 
You can check out a copy of Robert's book, Tinderbox, or you can visit one of Chicago's many bookstores to purchase a copy. We, I have one right here behind me. So Can I name a bookstore? Unabridged yeah. Books? Unabridged is one of our favorites, yes. Yes. And then if you're in the suburbs, Anderson's Bookshop in Naperville. So yes. I'll name those two. We love our um, independent bookstores here in Chicago. We work with many of them over They're incredible. Many years. Oh, Women and Children's First as well. Yeah. Wonderful yes. bookstore. Mm -hmm. So tonight's program, if you weren't able to join us, please tell your friends, will be available on the Chicago Public Library YouTube page. If people weren't able to join us tonight, please invite them to watch it on demand. And please visit the Chicago Public Library website for lots of upcoming virtual events at www.shypublib.org. So thanks again to everyone. And again, thanks to you, Robert W. Fiesler, for your talk on Tinderbox. Have a great night, Robert, and have a great night to everyone. A special thanks to our tech and marketing teams who helped promote tonight's program. Good night to everyone. Thank you. Good night.